Hello, psych friends, and welcome to another edition of General Psychology. All right, moving on to chapter eight, Cognition, Language, and Intelligence. This is one of those chapters that I'm probably going to boogie right on through. So this will not be as lengthy as the last chapter. All right, so let's, oh, always that first click gets me. All right, so starts off with a vignette. We are going to skip this. Feel free on your own time if you want to read through Dr. Taylor's story. All right, so early psychologist, um, introspection and personal conscious activities. If I asked you to remember who was the theorist that first had the first psych laboratory that is going to be on your midterm, that's only if you're a student of mine. If you're just watching the channel because you have nothing else to do, then by all means, keep watching and subscribe. But anyway, so if I were to ask you, introspection, which theorist, who would, who would you come up with? If you answered Wilhelm Wundt, you would be correct. All right, so in the 1930s, uh, the rise of behaviorism focus was on behaviors. When psychology started, it was focusing heavily on behaviors. And then as psychology grew, then they realized there was, you know, hey, there's more to this. And it became behavior and mental processes. Um, and then what was called the cognitive revolution in the 1950s, that's when they started blending cognition and thinking together. All right, so just textbooky definitions cognition is the mental activity associated with obtaining converting and using knowledge usually when i'm talking about cognition it's interchangeable with thinking because your cognitions are in your thoughts they're thought processes but thinking itself is the mental activity associated with coming to a decision reaching a solution or forming a belief um so just know the difference between cognition and thinking. All right, so we can skip over this one. Read it on your own, but we're gonna skip through. Actually, a lot of this we're going to um, skip through because this chapter, I find a lot of professors skip, but they cover it in other various chapters so that they don't have to heavily focus on this one. And you know every time you see this bright pink box, it's a collaboration, and because we're not in class, you are not gonna be doing this. But you can take a look at it and do it on your own, I guess. All right, um, your formal and your natural concepts, your formal mental representations of categories created through rigid and logical rules or through features, versus natural, think about it, um, that's, you get those through just daily experiences in life. Um, with your formal concepts, those allow you to categorize objects in very precise ways, versus with natural concepts, you develop these, you know, co these, you know, concepts um, according to how your culture is and your own individual experiences. And with formal, used heavily in natural sciences, um, and like your science and math type, where you're, it's very black and white. And then natural concepts, the example that they use and talk about in the book is forest bathing, which we don't need to get into that either. All right, um, we're going to skip over that. These are just little mental images. Um, and again, I'm skipping over this part because it's not something I'm really going to cover. But like I say with every chapter, if you're really into studying cognition and thinking and language and all that stuff, there's an entire semester dedicated to just that. This is not really um, something I ever go super deep into. All right. So. Every chapter, obviously, it's always going to bring up an area of the brain because remember, the brain, biology, psychology, it's all interchangeable. So 
in related to the vignette with Dr. Taylor's story um, and the left frontal lobe, which your frontal lobe is up here, which is critical in your executive decision making. Um, so with her, critical for a broad array of higher cognitive functions, processing emotions, controlling impulses and making plans, um, which due to her stroke, obviously any person that has a stroke, those your frontal lobe is probably going to suffer damage and kind of mess with those areas of those brain functions. Um, the Broca's and Wernicke's area, um, those are all associated with language and speech. And so that obviously was impacted with her stroke. All right, problem solving, variety of approaches we can use to achieve our goals. Um, how can this apply to your life? So think about a problem. This is just something you can think about. That's something that really we would cover too much anyways, but you can think about a problem you want to solve and identify the initial state, the goal state, and then the obstacles that are in your way. So within this chapter of cognition and thinking, it kind of shows you, gives you skills about problem solving. All right, so some strategies for problem solving. You've got trial and error, algorithms, heuristics. And like in the last chapter, I already talked about this briefly. Um, you also, if you look down at the bottom where it says aha moment. So problem solving is all about finding that aha moment. Um, and like they say, sometimes the best strategy is to step away and let your brain work behind the scenes because anytime you're trying to solve a problem and it's you're trying to figure it out right then and there, your brain sometimes says, stop, I can't do this right now. And so you just kind of have to step back from it. And that's when you have that aha moment. Same way in therapy, when I'm with clients, I will strategize with them. We will talk, we will brainstorm. And I always tell them that therapy doesn't happen in the room. It happens once they leave. So they're given all these skills and things to like think about. And then when they leave, they're like, oh, that's what that was. So this way, you know, they come up with, you come up with your own realization of whatever problem it is that you need to solve. So we're not worried about that. All right, so when you're looking at problem solving, you know, obviously you gotta understand what the problem is, choose an approach to solve that problem, and then evaluate that problem, and then figure out was the problem solved by the approach that you used. So you could pause the video and check this little infographic out. All right, let's see. Functional fixedness. Yeah, mental set. Oh, this is something really cool. I can't do this with you, but if we were in class, um, I would show you. Um, this is a really cool just technique, and we use this in counseling. We use this obviously in teaching psychology. It's called. Um, it's called the. What is this called? I actually forgot the name of it. It's not even on here, but um, it's like the. It's the box problem. That's what it. Is. The, the books. So without lifting your pencil, can you connect all nine dots using only four straight lines and without crossing any dot more than once? So I challenge you, and if you are in my class, go ahead and bring it to me. Um, and maybe I'll give you extra credit. Um, but don't cheat because it's not cool to cheat. See if you can actually do it. Um, so the point is, is to connect all the dots without lifting up your pen or pencil and four straight lines. That's all you get. Um, see if you can do it. And really, the only, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? The only clue I will give you is when you problem solve, you have to think outside the box. You, and that's why it's called the box. You Sometimes you can't just look at what's in the box. When you're looking for really good ideas, you have to think outside the box. That's where all the best ideas come from. So that's, that's a little clue I give you. So just be real with it. All right, 
Um, decision making, cognitive process of choosing from approaches used to achieve a goal often involves predicting the future. Some situations are more certain, others involve more unknowns. And of course, when there are unknowns, there are risks involved. So when making decisions, you want to understand what the process is. You want to use cognitions and thinking to make sure that you are making the correct, you know, predictions or whatever it is that you need for your future goals. All right, availability heuristics, if you've ever heard of that, decision-making strategy that predicts the likelihood of something happening based on how easily a similar type of event from the past can be recalled. Um, it can be accurate, but only when based on appropriate information. So they, they go into recency, frequency, familiarity, and then vividness. All right, um, do know what confirmation bias is. So right here, we'll focus on that. That's the tendency to look for evidence that upholds our beliefs and to overlook evidence that ruin that ruins, I'm sorry, ruins, runs, why did I say ruins, counter to them. So one of the reasons we are vulnerable to misinformation spread through the internet is we are looking for confirmation in something and sometimes we allow other influences to kind of cloud our judgment and our beliefs. All right, so confirmation bias and fake news. All right, so what is fake news? Did Donald Trump make that up? I mean, it was already in the textbook. I don't know. I mean, actually, this textbook just came out not too long ago. So actually, maybe he does get to coin the fake news. All right, so what is fake news? Social media uses algorithms to minimize discordant information, which functions like virtual confirmation bias. So how can we combat, combat fake news? So if I were to ask you, okay, what are some ways that we can we can get around fake news. Well, ask questions. Don't just take things at face value. Um, you have to make yourself look at information and not just go on the internet and say, oh, the internet said it, so it must be real. A lot of people say that and I'm like, oh, silly, silly. All right, so um, you, you have to look at things critically. You have to ask questions. You have to, look at multiple different sources, not just one source of information, but a, at least a good handful. And you want to look at ranges. So ones that agree with each other, ones that disagree with each other, and ones that look in the middle. Because, you know, like they always say, there's this person's story, that person's story, and then the truth lies somewhere in the middle, which is where, where you want to look. Know what hindsight bias is. That is the I knew it all along phenomenon. Um, so the mistaken belief that an outcome could have been predicted easily. So just know what that is. Maybe understand what an example of hindsight bias is if you were to see it on a test. So could you identify a situation where you actually experienced hindsight bias yourself? Kind of think about that. Maybe you have to Google it and look it up, look it up in your book, give an example, know an example. Okay. All right, we're going to skip over that. Um, head trauma, cognition, it's becoming, you know, very talked about, especially in the world of football. Um, they talk about the story of Harry Carson in your text, uh, football career spanned over 21 years. In that time, it is estimated that he took as many as 30,000 hits to his head. 30,000. Uh, they have what's called post-concussion syndrome. Includes a collection of physical and psychological symptoms that linger long after a concussion occurs, which is why a lot of football players will, after years of playing football, um, might develop these horrible anger issues, um, become, you know, involved in domestic violence or commit suicide. And that is because head trauma has a lot to do with that brain injury. So it's, every, every, you know, again, everything is linked to the brain. Um, also, when we look at um, Aaron Hernandez, 
um, that you see on the screen, you look at what's called CTE, um, chronic traumatic encephalopathy. Um, it's a neurodegenerative disease and it's caused by repeated head trauma. Symptoms include abnormal accumulation of tau, headaches, depression, anger, aggression. Um, and that you can read about in the book about um, Aaron Hernandez. All right, so now moving on to language. That is a system for using symbols to think and communicate. That's literally textbook what it is. Uh, language is spoken, written, or sign. It's not just, you know, verbal. Um, humans regularly find new meanings for old words or invent new ones. So if I were to ask you, hey, think about a word that meant something maybe in the 50s or 60s, and now that word today is something else. So if, again, if you're in my class and you can think of some old words that have been kind of reinvented into new words, write them down. Oh, I gotta turn my volume down, hello. Write them down, bring them into me, and earn yourself some extra credit. All right, perks of being bilingual, learning two languages. They say it's really important um, that you should learn at least two languages. Uh, it may actually improve a child's communication skills, leading to better performance in cognitive tasks, development of strong executive control due to constant exercising of the brain. So anytime you're learning a new skill, a new language, a new anything, your brain is, it's just, it's making those divots and it's, it's really good for exercising the brain and lowering chances of Alzheimer's disease. These I'm really not gonna go into. These are your basic elements of language that you learn in elementary school. However, if you are learn if you're going to be maybe speech pathology or going into you know psychology of speech, then these are things that you would have to know. So you would need to know what phonemes are, morphemes, syntax, grammar, semantics, and pragmatics. The only thing I will ask you to remember is just know the difference between syntax and semantics. Syntax and semantics. So Yoda syntax is, when gone am I, the last of the Jedi you will be. So that's, that's, Yoda syntax. So just know what syntax and semantics are. All right. Um, language acquisition device. That is a big Chomsky thing. That is something they will teach you in your English classes. Um, usually you'll, le you'll learn about Chomsky. You'll learn about Piaget. You will learn about Vygotsky. Um, you're going to learn those in this class, but if you're studying language specifically, you're gonna learn about those theorists. All right, we're gonna skip on through this. Uh, do animals use language? Of course they do, of course they do. I often wonder, what do dogs talk about when they bark? Like, what are they saying? Because we hear bark, 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 but what about when we talk? You ever think about like, what's their perception of us? They're probably thinking that we're like, wah, 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 wah. It's just so crazy to think about, you know, different, you know, various creatures and people and just, I don't know. I find all that kind of stuff super intriguing, but language itself, nah, not so much. All right, skipping over that. Um, so now moving into intelligence, it does not always go hand in hand with intelligent behavior. You can score great on an intelligence quotient test and it doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, there's a correlation, but again, correlation does not mean causation. So just know, again, with this chapter, just know the textbook definitions of like cognition and thinking and language and intelligence. So intelligence, you know, textbook definition, speaking like for psychology, it's one's innate ability to solve problems, adapt to the environment, and learn from experiences. So it doesn't mean how smart you are. It means how adaptable are you to your environment that, and you can learn from your past experiences. That brings intelligence and wiseness. I don't even know if that's a word, whatever. Um, so to some degree it is cultural, con con ugh, it is a cult cultural construct 
reflecting cultural values. All right, so you've got general intelligence, the G factor. So you've got Spearman and Gardner, who are two big kind of gurus in intelligence. They use um, the Gardner intelligences uh, a lot in education. Um, so looking at multiple intelligences, which I'm sure you've you've seen that wheel maybe, and it's asking like. What are your, you know, we don't just have one intelligence level. We have multiple intelligences. So if you look at this slide, um, this will give you your logical, mathematical, linguistic, musical, spatial, bodily, kinesthetic, which means like, you know, you've got to manipulate and move hands and kind of fix things. Those are, you know, people that are great with their surgeons and auto mechanics and different kinds of, you know, skills like that. And then there's interpersonal and intrapersonal. So if you look at the middle, your logical mathematical people are very science-based and math, very mathy. Your linguistics are your poets and your journalists. Your musical people are your composers. Your spatial people are like your sculptors. They're very good navigators, um, bodily kinesthetic, dancer, athlete, um, interpersonal, if you have good interpersonal skills, you'll make, you know, you could potentially make a good therapist or a salesperson. Um, and then intrapersonal, those are person with detailed, accurate self-knowledge. So you can look over to the right and kind of see, um, you know, the, the examples. But there's also a test that I, I give out um, to see what intelligences that you fall under as well. All right, so your theories of intel uh, intelligence, <laughs> let me make up a new word, intelligence. All right, you've got your practical, analytical, creative. Um, Sternberg's triarchic theory of intelligence, as you can see there, your analytic intelligence are those problem solving abilities. Your creative intelligence is your knowledge and skills on how to adapt and handle different situations. And then your practical intelligence is your ability to adjust to different environments. So if you have a practical intelligence, then maybe you can move from New York to Florida, Florida to New York or wherever in between, and you're very adaptable in your environment. So it's just different types of intelligences. All right, so your IQ test, those are your aptitude tests. Know what that is. Know that an IQ test is an aptitude test. Um, and then your achievement test are your like your SAT and your ACT. So just know the difference between the two. So if I were to ask you, what is an example of an aptitude test? And it was a multiple choice. Know that IQ test would be aptitude. And if I asked you, what is an example of an achievement test? And SAT and ACT were on there. Just know that. All right, then you've got your um, uh, Binet came out. There was Simon, you know, Binet, Simon and Binet, two different people. Um, they came out with intelligence um, testing, and they use those a lot in elementary school. Um, and they look at what is your mental age, not your actual age, but based on intelligence testing, they'll look at that, and then there it allows them to make comparisons among different groups of people. All right, so when you look at the Stanford Binet test, uh, term and revise Stern's work, change and added items, develop standards for the US for US children, and extended test to teens and adults. It's now in its fifth edition for the Stanford Binet. Right now, um, a lot of people they'll use the Wexler test. Um, and that's uh, there's many different subtests within the Wexler. Um, all different types. Uh, if you go into, uh, you can actually, again, take a class in this and you're going to learn all different kinds of different testing devices. But if you decide to go for your higher degree, um, I had to take this class and all I learned about was all different kinds of testing. ADHD testing, you know, intelligence testing, um, personality, all kinds of tests that you would have to, to kind of know. And then I had to write papers on them, but it is actually interested, even though I'm not interested in that, you kind of, as a clinician, you need to know what these are so that if you have a client come in, that's if you're in therapy, that you need to be able to direct 
somebody in the, you know, the right avenue um, so that the, they could be provided with these types of tests. All right, we're going to skip over that, skip over that. You could look at this, freeze it, look at the still PowerPoint on your own. Um, what do we, we could look at this on your own too. Reliability thing. Reliability means consistency. So let me just give you that because you will see this on a test. I, I had said, remember what reliability and consistency are. Reliability, not boop. Reliability is consistency. So that means that if you take a test, okay, mark is red. If you take a test, um, is that going to be, when you take it, say the Myers-Briggs test, where it gives you the four letters. And if you take it today and then you take it two months from now, is it going to give you the same results? over and over again. If it does, that's a reliable test because it's giving you consistent results. You always got to make sure that the test is also fair. Um, this is just more on intelligence and, you know, differences in cultural testing, uh, looking at standardization, the normal bell curve. We don't have to worry about that. Um, looking at intellectual disability, Disability, delay in thinking, intelligence, and social practical skills before age 18. Um, IQ, that's less than 70. Um, they look at, and that's, you would learn that in this class, what is considered um, low level intelligence. Um, you would learn about causes of intellectual disabilities um, because it all, again, it, it, it has to do with you know, chromosomes and different things that you're born with. So like Down syndrome, fetal alcohol syndrome, that's if uh, the mother was drinking during pregnancy, then there's the fragile X syndrome, and then also other various environmental factors. All right, so again, remember a high IQ score does not guarantee success in all areas of life. Um, you, you always wanna make sure that you actually learn things Doing intelligence testing and having a high IQ is really awesome, but you know there are factors that high IQ can also mean low, low in other areas. So it's good to like you know have a balance in things. Um, multiple studies show intelligence makes for better leaders. You know there's a but though. Followers may view highly intelligent leaders as less effective. The researchers looked at 379 male and female business leaders in 30 countries. Managers took IQ tests and each was rated on leadership style and effectiveness by an average of eight coworkers. And the ratings peaked at an IQ of around 120. Beyond that, the ratings just declined. Oh. All right, so we'll skip over that. Heritability just means that, you know, when you look at the origins of intelligence, they're the biggest debate, again, in psychology that you have to know is nature nurture. So obviously there is going to be heritability when it comes to intelligence. So if generally speaking, if you have highly intelligent parents, chances are you are gonna be intelligent. But again, correlation, not causation. All right, twin studies are always used in psychology because it, it's, they look at genetics and then they look at environment because, you know, they look at identical twins and fraternal twins and then twins that are reared apart. And that's how they get a lot of their rich information with studies. Um, characteristics of creativity. So if you look at the characteristic, originality, fluency, flexibility, knowledge, thinking, personality, and then your intrinsic motivation, it'll give you the meaning behind that. So just originality is the ability to come up with unique solutions when trying to solve a problem. So rather than trying to look for something from a book or someone else's stuff, you try to come up with your own original kind of meaning or solution to something. So you can look at that stuff and, you know, on your own. All right. Um, it's good to know divergent and convergent thinking. Um, divergent thinking is ability to devise many solutions to a problem. Um, it's also a component to creativity. And then convergent thinking is conventional approach to problem solving, focuses on finding a single best solution 
to a problem by using previous experience and knowledge. So it looks at, you know, just that typical way of, okay, what worked before in the past that, you know, helped me gain this knowledge versus that divergent thinking, which is when you're kind of looking outside of the box. So we're skipping through that. This goes back to the vignette. And we are done. We did that in about 30 minutes. All right, cool. So I am done. I'm glad this one was shorter than the last one. Boop. All right, so with that said, hey, be kind to each other. Be kind to yourself. And until I see you in the next video, peace. Got to do it this way. Peace.